Hello, my name is Carl Herzog. I'm a public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. And welcome to our panel discussion, International Sailors for the Nation's Ship. Uh, this program is brought to uh, you at the uh, help of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Joining me in this conversation today are uh, Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, Associate Professor of History, Spatial Sciences and Law, at University of Southern California's Dornsife College of Letters, Arts and Sciences, and the author of Citizen Sailors, Becoming American in the Age of Revolution. Also joining me are Logistics Specialist Third Class, Jason petit Frere, currently on active duty on the USS Constitution. Uh, LS3 uh, petit Frere is a, a native of Haiti, now a US citizen. He was naturalized while in service on USS Constitution. Where I'll be having a conversation uh, today about uh, non-citizens and uh, foreign-born service members, both in the Navy and on Constitution, and the shaping of American identity as a result through the Navy uh, from the beginnings of the United States and uh, USS Constitution's active uh, sailing period, all the way up through today as the experiences of uh, Jason Petit Frere suggest. This is indeed a conversation and uh, we encourage uh, you to join us in asking questions uh, because also joining us today are our registered attendees and Facebook Live viewers. So feel free to ask questions, use the chat uh, window in either platform that you're joining us on today. And we have staff monitoring those, uh, museum staff monitoring those to forward your questions and comments and so that you too can participate in the conversation. This panel discussion will be archived uh, in the USS Constitution Museum website and our YouTube channel. And if you missed our first of these panel discussions on the history of protecting global commerce and USS Constitution's role in that from August, you can find that now on our uh, YouTube channel as well. And stay tuned, we'll be having uh, future panel discussions and similar events. Uh, Jevin, uh, Jason, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us uh, today to talk about this kind of uh, fascinating topic at a pivotal point. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Nathan, I'd like to start with you. Uh, your book, uh, Citizen Sailors, takes a look at sort of this phenomenon of um, American identity forged through maritime experience and, and the Navy and um, the idea of uh, non-citizens or foreign-born sailors becoming part of uh, the American experience uh, while on board and how that was sort of codified as a result of events at sea. Can you tell us a little bit about how this sort of phenomenon began to evolve and, and to the point that we're still talking about it today. Yeah, yeah. Um, you hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, you sound great. Awesome, okay. Well, first of all, let me say thank you, Carl. It's nice to be here and it's wonderful to be here with Jason. Uh, got to get, get been getting to know you just a little bit and looking yes. forward to some more <laughs> in this in this conversation. Um, so I thought I would I thought I would just give a sort of very broad brush kind of contextualization or you know context for the for for this um, this revolutionary moment um, of late 18th early 19th century. Um, so the maritime world has always been in some sense a kind of place of encounter of mobility of exchange, right? That's um, what it was uh, in the era before telecommunications. If you wanted to go somewhere far away, you went, went over water. Um, and uh, so that you're always seeing moments of encounter, but it's, it's in the early modern period, really in the 17th and 18th centuries, let's say the century and a half before American independence, um, that you see the rise of national fleets, the idea that both merchant marines and navies um, are staffed essentially by your own subjects or sometimes or rarely citizens. Um, so you still have mixing, you still have contact, but there's the idea that's developed in this century and a half for reasons that I can get into if anybody's interested, but don't really matter too much for our purposes today, that you wanna have a Navy and a merchant Marine that are staffed by your own guys. Um, and so when US independence comes in 1776, there's a really interesting problem that develops. 
um, this is sort of the, the heart of, of Citizen Sailors, um, it's really hard to tell who's British and who's American because they sound the same and they look the same and they have the same mannerisms and they behave the same ways because, you know, until right before American independence, they were all members of the same political unit, the British Empire. Um, and so part of what develops is this kind of crisis in the 40 years after American independence over something that previously had seemed kind of self-evident. Well, this ship is full of French guys, so it's probably a French ship. And this ship is full of British guys, so it's probably British. And suddenly you come upon a ship at sea, let's say, um, if you, you know, a, a, a vessel, a merchant vessel, or even a warship is stopped at sea, it's full of English speaking men. Is it British or is it American? Not so clear. Um, and so this develops into a, a sort of significant uh, uh, series of crises that I'm happy to talk about more. I don't want to monopolize the time, but just want to keep, keep setting the stage. And in the 1790s, this starts really with American independence, but it grows exponentially in the 1790s because that's when American commerce becomes the commerce of the world, really, or at least the Atlantic world. Um, you have an extraordinary boom in American commerce during that period, um, which is backed up by a moderate expansion of the Navy. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this, in the year 1800, the United States built a thousand new vessels, merchant vessels, just in the year 1800, um, something like 100,000 uh, tons burden together. Um, so there's an extraordinary expansion and that's like, it creates a kind of giant sucking sound um, in the Western Atlantic, right? Along the Eastern seaboard, because think of all of those ships, who's gonna man all those ships? Suddenly you have large numbers of foreign born sailors who are coming into the American um, uh, 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 maritime world, and partly because it's at this time, and we can talk about that as we go along, very easy to become an American, generally speaking, in the 1790s, um, for most people, make some exceptions, um, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but um, it's quite easy to become an American. Lots of people come, start serving in the merchant marine or even in the Navy and, um, and then become um, Americans. You have lots of Northern Europeans, you have Southern Europeans, and you also have people from the Caribbean. Um, so it's not just um, white Northern Europeans, it's also uh, free black people from places like um, Barbados, uh, Jamaica, um, and then ultimately from, uh, from uh, Saint-Domingue and what becomes um, the, the nation of Haiti in 1804. And you can see this continuing, this kind of national diversity of the American maritime world um, continue into the 19th century. I don't know how many of you have instant recall of Moby Dick, but there's a wonderful scene um, at the masthead where you have all of these different people talking to one another, identified by their nationalities. Um, and the idea is that this whaling ship is kind of a, a meeting place of all the nationalities. Um, and that, of course, uh, bleeds over into the Navy uh, because in, that, in the 19th century, as before, the labor pool for the Navy and the merchant marine um, is quite similar. So all of this to say that the maritime world, the American maritime world becomes in the late 18th and early 19th century, a particularly, um, and into the, well into the 19th century, a particularly diverse um, group, a particularly diverse population um, in terms of nationalities, in terms of race, um, partly because there's this enormous expansion underway where American commerce is, um, is expanding dramatically. Um, and that really has implications for thinking about um, in a world where people are think of the Navy and of the Merchant Marine as being national, sort of squaring this diversity with a desire uh, frequently for a kind of national homogeneity. So I, I don't wanna, um, I wanna, I think I, I think I wanna stop there for now just to sort of set the scene and turn it back to you, Carl, but, um, but uh, I, God, I could talk about it all day, so. Uh. Well, we don't have all day, but, um, but we'll <laughs> definitely keep talking for a little while. Yeah, it, there's a, I think there's a couple of points that, that you raised that are um, really fascinating to us here at the USS Constitution Museum and our study of, of Constitution and the rest of the early Navy. And uh, among those elements is the, the idea that, you know, there was a confusion because uh, you were looking at English sailors or, or sort of um, you know, uh, English, Scottish, Irish kind of sailors uh, who, could easily be mistaken, at least for our, you know the New England uh, area, English origin um, American sailors, and uh, and there was that potential for confusion. But as you indicate, um, you know people who became American, it was a matter of declaration, right? And that you know the early nation was uh, fairly open to the idea of, of of entry, and it made sense and was. 
um, valuable then as, as I'm sure Jason can say now it, for the Navy in terms of uh, the value that they, they get out of that, that sort of, you know, that participation. Um, but it did become more diverse as other nations came in. And from the USS Constitution standpoint, our numbers on this uh, remain a little bit blurry by very virtue of, of the issue of impressment. Um, our primary numbers on how broad this phenomenon was, particularly on USS Constitution, are based largely from sailors self-identifying on their muster rolls as to where they were born. And many of them, even if they did consider themselves Americans by this point, were hesitant or reluctant to identify as having been born in England or Ireland um, because of the fact that they could still be uh, you know, pressed by the Brits and, and taken back, um, even you know, regardless of what they, they claimed their new naturalized identity uh, to be. Uh, in other research we've done at Constitution over the War of 1812, we've identified um, about 37 sailors who openly on the muster rolls identified themselves as having been born in Ireland, but, but also identified as, as being American by the point that they were there. English sailors, we think the numbers were much higher, but they were even more reluctant to self-identify um, for fear of impressment in, in 1812. The phenomenon though, regardless of citizenship or nationality of a broad swath of international sailors coming to serve on constitution and in the broader Navy um, continued in the decades after, um, you know, after the War of 1812 and, and after that issue of, of British naval impressment had largely been resolved. Um, when Constitution was serving on squadron duty in the Mediterranean, uh, we have evidence that on several occasions they were uh, essentially enlisting um, foreign nationals with no intent of becoming uh, citizens or Americans to still serve there. In 1804, while on station in Syracuse, Italy, uh, the uh, USS Constitution uh, enlisted uh, more than two dozen Maltese sailors uh, who came on board in Syracuse in Italy, stayed for six months, and they helped fill out the billet while Constitution was waiting for relief from the rest of the squadron coming across the Atlantic um, uh, from Boston and New York. And six months later, when their duties were no longer required, those Maltese sailors, per their original agreement, it was a six-month stint, uh, got off and were taken back to Valletta and Malta. Um, so they were, you know, that was, uh, they did not stay on. Other Maltese sailors later on, and, and Constitution has a rich history of them, uh, of association with uh, Malta and, and the Maltese community, uh, did end up coming back. Uh, they signed on in Valletta and then were discharged uh, in Boston or New York. Uh, essentially becoming uh, American at that point. Um, similarly, uh, it, again, in the Mediterranean, we have evidence that Constitution uh, at one point um, while on uh, squadron duty there in the late 1840s, um, hired as enlisted first class musicians in the US Navy, uh, an entire Italian band um, and they were doing a lot of diplomatic work and, and ceremonial work on that, on that squadron duty. And I guess they felt they needed musicians. Um, and I've talked to uh, historians at the USS Constellation who have found similar evidence that they too did the same thing. Um, they don't know how many, if any of them, uh, you know, ended up coming back or staying longer or just simply returned. Uh, so that pattern of whether they were coming in uh, to, you know, becoming part of that uh, American panorama or, or were just there as utility was a product of what you're talking about, Nathan. I think this broadening and this, you know, cross boundary sort of experience that uh, and needs, you know, when you're on the other side of the world that they had. Um, but as the Navy matured and become more, um, more organized and structured, so do did the programming and the attitudes toward doing that. And the pattern since then 
uh, for foreign-born service members and non-citizens serving in the military has ebbed and flowed with the needs of, of the Navy and the rest of the military, as you can expect, rising higher during times of war and then dropping off during times of peace. Um, huge spikes uh, in World War One and to a lesser degree in World War II, um, and then up and down in the last uh, you know, 60, 70 years between Korea and uh, Vietnam, and then the sort of global war on terror in, in post 9-11. More recently, however, uh, the, um, the desire for um, recruiting uh, foreign-born service members and non-citizens has shaped to a sort of mutual benefit of what can the Navy, you know, what are the Navy's needs? And through a program that began around 10 years ago, Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest, or MAVNI as it was known, uh, the Navy began um, creating specific programs to encourage uh, those foreign-born um, and non-citizen uh, people living in the United States to, uh, to participate in, in the service because they needed those skill sets. Uh, today, or at least um, the last survey that was done, about 4% of the Navy um, accessions, those initial take-ins, uh, uh, are non-citizens. Um, uh, Jason, you've been in the Navy now for three years? Yes. yes. Three years, yeah. And you came in as, as a non-citizen. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you think that fits into um, what the Navy was looking for and what you uh, in turn got back from them. Uh, that is a great question. And um, I'd have to kind of go through the chronology of basically how I got here in the first place, um, which kind of ties into the question you asked earlier, Nathan, about um, when I moved to the United States, uh, where exactly did I go? So I suppose here you finally get the, the answer, um, just a, in a bit more detail. Um, so background information about myself, I did not move to the United States until I was about 14 years old for my freshman year in high school. Um, then I transitioned from Haiti to uh, Traverse City, Michigan, which as we discussed once again, it was a huge change in temperature, all right? So the, 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 the reason for such a huge jump um, uh, and such a big move essentially was due to familial relations or uh, basically connections that we had in that specific state, which allowed for a, a smoother transition from our life in Haiti to our life in the United States as well as ease of signing up in the educational system and whatnot. So it was just all around more convenient to go there. So there's no crazy special reason why we, um, aside from those, why I went to Michigan, but then I spent the rest of high school in Florida, equal, um, some parts, it was my sophomore and junior year in Fort St. Lucie, Florida, then moved to uh, Orlando, Florida for my senior year, then back to Fort St. Lucie, uh, for some work, a bit of college. And then in 2017 on September, um, in the month of September, that's when I joined the United States Navy. Um, well, that's when I went to boot camp. I joined just a little bit before that, but the timer doesn't start until you go for the boot camp. So it's kind of true. Anyway. Um, so you'd already gone to college for a couple of years down there. And then what prompted, so then what prompted the shift? Why did you decide to join? That's a good question too. <laughs> Okay, so you came seriously equipped today. Uh, so what prompted me to join? Oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make a call back to when I was uh, interviewed for uh, one of the other, <laughs> you're laughing right now because you know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> but, oh man, uh, when I was interviewed for uh, one of the other museum display pro or what was it? It was um, our today's crew exhibit. Exactly. Thank you very much. Today's crew exhibit. Um, and what I started with was I joined the Navy to learn how to fold my sheets or <laughs> something of the sort, something like that, which was not too much of a departure from the actual reason why I joined. It was just, I would say, an oversimplification of it um, because 
what do you find in learning how to fold your sheets? You find structure, you find discipline, you find routine, um, you find a way to build character, a way to develop yourself. And that's exactly what I was looking for in joining the Navy. Um, I could have joined any branch of the service, but I decided to go Navy not only due to the fact that I have an older sister of two years who's also in the Navy. She's one rank higher, but we don't need to worry about that. Um, and <laughs> her presence in the Navy basically played a role in which direction I was going, but more so the fact that the Navy, to me, was the best branch as far as getting exposed to most of the world as possible. Um, so a simpler word, or in, in a word, mobility. That's what I was looking for. Um, so having joined the Navy in 2017, prior to joining the Navy, I'd already started the process, if I'm remembering it correctly, of becoming an American citizen. So by that time, I was just a, a resident with my green card and everything. Um, but joining the Navy basically expedited that process. Um, it simplified it. And as far as, um, eh, I'm not basically too keen on speaking on things that I don't really know the ins and outs of. So I'm just going to give you a simpler picture, just my file or my case basically due to me being a military member was then bumped up in priority as far as getting it done um, due to the fact that it's not just, you know, oh, he's a military member, let's just push him up. But things like um, your rate or your job in the Navy, say for example, CT, uh, uh, which is relating to cryptology or IT, which is information te technology um, or information technician, if I'm remembering correctly. Those are uh, relating to um, uh, the, the cyber world, okay? So we're talking, dealing with computers, electronics, all that kind of stuff. Um, and those rates require certain levels of, uh, oh my goodness, what is the word? Um, clearance, there we go. Yeah. I was having a bit of a <laughs> blank moment there, but clearance. And certain levels of clearance are not allowed to non-American citizens, as well as there are certain commands and or ships that you cannot go to unless you are an American citizen. Now, as for the reason for that, and specifically the, the, the ideas behind the limitations they placed there, um, I can, once again, this is more so my own personal stab at it, but going by the clearance side of things, you really don't want somebody who does not pledge allegiance to the flag seeing stuff that is secret, top secret, confidential, whatever it is, because it goes from could potentially pose a threat to national security to most definitely will endanger national security. Yeah. So you don't want somebody who is, you know, not a citizen, who's not dedicated to the country, at the very least on paper, see, having exposure or having access to, to such um, tools who could who could potentially later on become what we call an insider threat or a spy, whatever it is. So those are the kinds of things that we constantly have to be not only aware of, but planning against in advance, because we prefer to be in the preventative business as opposed to the cleanup business, because that's, that's the best for everybody, honestly. Um, Always easier. That, exactly. that balance of national security and the value that, um, you know, that recruits bring to the Navy is an on, has been uh, an ongoing um, sort of up and down debate. But that role of allegiance and the role of, you know, the, uh, the non-citizen sailors is still new as well as that skill set. Um, Nathan, in your experience, was any of this, this idea of are you really serving America if you're serving on part of that early, uh, early experience? Yeah, I, you know, it's an interesting question. I, um, one, of the, one of the problems we have with answering that particular question is a source problem. Um, so before about 1815, there are actually very few, relatively speaking, very few 
sources in the voice of ordinary seamen. Um, it's really after 1815 that you start getting the big wave of um, uh, personal narratives, um, uh, letters start to survive um, from sailors. So it's very hard for us to get at these kinds of questions of, um, of personal belief um, or personal um, loyalty. Uh, but it seems pretty clear that, um, you know, ships before, um, uh, you know, before uh, the mechanical age are very technical. Uh, it's a technical profession. I mean, it is now, but by comparison, the, the difference between sailing and fighting on land is much greater in the 18th and early 19th century than it is now. Now I would say both of them, you need technical training. In the 18th century, a soldier consisted of someone who could fire a gun more or less in the right direction. I mean, at the highest level, it was people who were maneuvered and whatever, but you know, being able to fire a gun was the crucial thing. Right. Sailing was a highly technical profession and you needed to have enough able seamen on board or the ship was gonna go down. I mean, it was really quite dangerous if you didn't have the sufficient numbers. So I think, um, you know, in, in that sort of situation, the question of whether someone did or did not have loyalty to the flag was probably less important than making sure that you know, uh, that the flag stayed flying on a ship that was above water rather than below water. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm being sort of facetious, but actually it's pretty clear when they're in foreign ports, when you see um, early American ships in foreign ports, you know, when they're short of men, they can't leave port and it's, 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 it becomes an operational issue, right? So as early as, I mean, I was thinking as you were talking, Carl, about, about uh, constitution, you know, as early as the 1770s, I mean, you, you can see this in 1779, that is to say, a year after the United States signs its Treaty of Alliance with France, the first Treaty of Alliance that the independent United States creates, you have a number of ships in France, including the Bonhomme Richard and several others whose names escape me right now, which have large numbers, uh, the ship Boston actually, which I've written about a little bit, the, the ship that carried John Adams to, um, to France, um, at one point had about a third of its crew was Frenchmen. Um, now those are allied subjects, so maybe that's okay, but the point was they couldn't leave port unless they had these guys. Yeah. Um, so I think at that point it becomes a you know necessity is 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 more important than uh, the, the need to, to be able to leave um, is more more important than anything else. I wanted to jump on though the um, I mean I don't want to interrupt but I, I I do want to just follow up on the citizenship question though because I think it's a really really interesting one. Um, you know this idea of I mean Jason your experience of right military service as a way to jump to the head of the line and we know the line for u.s immigration is very long if you're from certain parts of the world at the moment you can wait 40 years literally um to get to the head of the line um and what's interesting about that and this this i think connects to the question that's been asked in the chat what's interesting about that is that this is all a product of the post um really post 1924 era before 1924 basically with some restrictions Becoming a US citizen, if you're a white person, is easy. Um, in the 1790s, for the first part of the 1790s, literally all you had to do was you had to live here for two years and then go and swear before basically any court, any kind of court um, that you, uh, to swear allegiance and you'd be on a US citizen. In the 19th century, it's a little more restrictive. You have to wait a few more years. There are certain kinds of courts you have to swear to, but basically you live here for five years, you go to a court, you get your papers, end of story. It's only after 1924 that you have a restrictive immigration regime in the United States. And what's called the Johnson-Reed Act creates that. And we don't need to get into the ins and outs of it, but we live still in the world of this relatively restricted immigration regime. Um, and so that's when after 1924, it becomes really important, um, the, the kind of um, advantage that comes from military service or from other special categories, uh, it becomes really important um, and valuable. Um, military service and other things as, a, as access to citizenship. Because before that, it's it's really not, the barrier is very low. Um, yeah. So And that's yeah. the same time period, you know, you talk about the 1920s, roughly 100 years ago, that also in the wake of World War I, of when there was this incredibly increased demand and as a result in an increase of uh, non-citizens joining into the military that I think there was a recognition as well of the value of that. Um, Jason, coming back to why you joined and then, so you sort of had that citizenship uh, lined up. Yes. Where does it, so you were actually on a uh, constitution when you were naturalized. Were you aware that that was going to be the way that unfolded or? 
how did how did that come about? I'm curious on the subject of citizenship. I I basically honestly I was about to say I approached this a certain way, but that is not really the case at all. It it basically just approached me, and I don't want to put it that way because I literally did not know what to expect as far as becoming a citizen and um, how simple or how complicated the process would be either in or out of the Navy. I just knew it took time. And being a bit more frank, um, during the whole situation, I was juggling a lot more than the, the, the application for citizenship or the interview that I had to, to uh, attend at City Hall um, or a building of sorts in Boston. Um, but essentially I had to go through an interview. Then the last step I had to take was uh, an oral test with that same interviewer, um, which was for somebody who's already speaking English and somebody who's been exposed to history and somebody who's being trained in history by some of the most amazing museum staff. All right, that test right there was, it was a breeze. I'll just be completely honest. But that was due to the, the basically the, I, would, I want to call it, quote unquote, the bias of knowledge that I already had um, at my disposal. Um, but I did want to uh, make mention of the fact that based on what you asked and how it turned out, it was a complete shock, but in the best way possible. Um, due to the fact that as the, the picture that, that you used in the beginning, um, that was a shot of my naturalization ceremony on the main hatch of the USS Constitution, the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the entire world. I almost wanted to start my tour there. <laughs> Every time I say it, I'm like, okay, so in 1797, and then I just go on my tour. But anyway, the reason why that meant so much is because I literally took my first steps as an American citizen on the United States Navy, the world's most powerful Navy, the Navy's, one of the Navy's first ships ever, and the last remaining original ship from that timeline. It's, it's something that when you say it, you can't even really say it all in one breath because it's just so many different levels of, of shock and awe, I would say. And credit to our current CEO, um, Commander John Benda, 76, our 76 CEO, he played a huge role in um, basically keeping in contact with uh, the presiding uh, judge that came to conduct that ceremony and convincing them to conduct it on the Constitution. Because um, as some of you may or may not know, our, our CEO is a Massachusetts native, so he was all about the ship, all for the ship, and he was... he seriously offered so much support that I was, you know, crazy surprised. Like, you know, my captain is really about me becoming American citizen. Like, what is this? I expected like my direct superior or something, but he was like asking me consistently, okay, so how's it going? What's going on? And it didn't stop at me either. Um, one of my fellow shipmates, um, Vivas Tejada, he is a native of Venezuela and he was also um, naturalized here as well. Um, and I believe Sekiziyivu is a third one in the pipeline. So I, I don't know if he has some sort of quota that he's trying to meet, but he's, he's, he's working hard right now. Um, that being said though, I did um, want to kind of direct a question towards either, either of you, but more specifically Nathan as, as uh, concerning um, what you mentioned earlier. And then Carl, if you'd like to circle back to the citizenship question more than welcome to, but I just didn't want it to die out before, you know, I asked this question, but you mentioned the, the, the large expansion of, of our merchant fleet, um, which basically created a demand for anyone and everyone that could uh, man that fleet. Bringing that close, um, taking that away from merchant and bringing that to Navy, um, and you made a very good point about the fact that the, the soldier versus the sailor and the technicalities involved in the training that would be needed to be a sailor. Like when, at what point, if not accurately, then would you guesstimate that 
with the evolution of the Navy and the evolution of technology and the evolution of ships, did it go from anybody who can to more so our guys um, to the point where the Navy nowadays, it's you have to be at the very least a foreign born resident or an American citizen. So can you speak at all on at what point do you believe the transition started happening where it's it started to become more exclusive as opposed to whoever's able? Uh oh, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> my get so I, again, this is really a guesstimate. I, right, I right, right. suspect partly that it depends. You know, uh, we talked about this before amongst ourselves that the you know the one of the characteristic things about military forces in general, but I think navies are particularly this way. Um, uh, is there at least in the pre twentieth century period? Is they're incredibly cyclical, right? They they grow enormously in wartime, and the labor force shrinks a lot in in peacetime. Yes. So part of it is certainly um, about wartime versus peacetime. Um, so during the Revolutionary War and during the quasi war with France at the end of the seventeen nineties, and then again during the War of eighteen twelve, you would have these these peaks of demand. Um, and it's worth saying, you know, if you were if you were a capable seaman in the late 18th or early 19th century, first half of the 19th century, your goal was to get the safest um, employment you could find mm. that paid the best. And the Navy was, I'm sorry to say, at the absolute bottom of the list because they didn't pay super well and it had the chance of getting shot to pieces. Whereas if you were on a merchant vessel, the worst thing that was going to happen to you, they paid better. And the worst thing that would happen to you is you would get captured and released, which is what was done. They would capture you and then they'd let you go. And privateering, which was sort of private ships of war, sort of private vessels that were given a commission by the government, they were very dangerous, like the Navy, but at least you got paid better. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you can read in, you know, in, in any of the sort of um, correspondence of naval officers all through the 18th century, well into the 19th century, they are so ups they're constantly fighting with privateers for men because um, the privateers are always paying better. They give bonuses, um, and the, the working conditions are pretty similar. Um, so, but my guess would be that it's in the second half of the 19th century that you start seeing that shift um, where you know the the sailing vessel becomes less important and the the technical skill involved in the sailing vessel becomes less, um, right, less um, important. Because right. um, the usual norm was something like at least a year at sea before you could really be considered an able seaman. Um, and uh, uh, so once you're able to kind of bring people, you know, on board and have them um, sort of do the work of the ship without needing them to be experienced, um, which is more the case again with the, with the, the, um, the non, um, uh, uh, non-sale ships, then I think you would see that shift take place. So my, my guess would be the second half of the 19th century, but don't ask me for a particular year because I, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure anybody knows the answer, but I bet someone does, but it isn't me, I'm afraid. It, it, it is kind of a, there, I think there's sort of two halves to, to what um, you're tackling there, which is um, the idea of how often, you know, how much skill was required and how much nationality mattered. And as Nathan suggests throughout uh, the 18th century, um, you know, sailing ships were as, as uh, we well know, um, you know, as complex in their own way as modern vessels and uh, just as demanding of a discrete skill set. Um, but the Navy, by virtue of the size of its crew and the, um, the sort of duplication and specialization of individual crew members, did open the door for more inexperienced um, people to come on board even in the age of sail. Because, you know, where a small, a merchant vessel, every extra crew member that you put on board is, is taking a dollar out of your profit margin, right? And, and you are not exactly, you know, you're not necessarily in a rush to a life or death rush to ensure that you have enough crew on board to, to maneuver the vessel on, you know, on turning it on a dime, so to speak, um, because you're under fire. So merchant vessels ended up being uh, dramatically smaller per vessel size um, as a product of vessel size than military vessels. 
And as a result, it was more significant for merchant vessels to, to have sailors who already had some experience or were able to um, substantively contribute you know, across the board. And this is even truer, um, surprisingly, the smaller the vessel gets, not the larger it gets. Because the larger it gets, and as you get into trans uh, transoceanic passages, the larger the crew comes, the more you know becomes, the more discrete the job assignments are, um, and the increase in a level of hierarchy within the crew. Small coastal vessels operating, merchant vessels operating in the mid 18th century, between New England and the Caribbean, were you know frequently catches and sloops, one two masted vessels with fewer than you know, a half a dozen to a dozen crew on board, and the captain all the way down to the lowliest deckhand were sharing a lot of the same responsibilities. Um, and so you know, if, you're, if you're the master of one of these boats, literally, you know, <laughs> quite literally boats more than ships, um, you're looking for somebody who's going to have that skill set because you're more dependent on it. Um, so there's, there's that sort of conundrum going on. And as a result, um, you know, this is part of what I think makes the merchant marine um, a really attractive resource for finding military sailors during that time period. If, if you'd been doing that work, odds were you already had more skill than, you know, than say more uh, skill on deck operating a vessel. Um, than a lot of the ancillary responsibilities that might have existed on a large warship. But the flip side that what Nathan's talking about is, is kind of fascinating and that all of this, this world of expertise and specialization of sail gets turned upside down on its head in the second half of the 19th century by the arrival of steam. And so the vessels get larger, but the skill sets um, change radically. Uh, you know, you go from wood to metal, and that affects everything uh, from the maintenance of it and what you're expecting even the lowliest person to, to do. But it also changes where the expertise was. You know, one of the classic sort of conundrums of sail was that the captain was the master of, of the ship in the very sense that he knew everything intimately you know, often had come up through the hawse pipe and, and started out as a deckhand and worked their way up. Um, but with the arrival of steam, he's no longer the, in charge of the destiny of the vessel. He is dependent on a specialized steam engineer with an independent license, who at one hand is a lower level than him on the ship, but on the other hand is, is at a ambiguously higher level because he has control over the knowledge and the power, the knowledge of the power that is operating the ship. Um, so that turns the crew dynamics uh, upside down on their head. And there's a rich historiography associated with these changes uh, during that time period. But those changes, as Nathan suggests, and, and per your question, Jason, also shape um, you know, where you're getting your sailors from and what you're expecting them to do. Uh, and so it changes the, the sort of recruiting dynamic, I think, um, in terms of, uh, you know, where they're coming from and how many bodies you need and what those bodies are capable of doing. Yeah. So I did want to actually, this question right here, I, I cannot not ask this question before the stream is over and whatnot, but this is... Um, it is directed to Nathan, but I would definitely enjoy a bit of um, input from you as well, Carl, afterwards, uh, based off of your wealth of knowledge as a historian. Um, but this is based on your book, sir. You wrote it, so I hope you read it and are ready for this question. <laughs> so in, in your prologue, it was, it was, it was a, an amazing beginning, by the way. I absolutely enjoyed reading this. And for those Thank of you guests watching this right now, my major in college or high school was never history. And yet a book like this, chock full of historical knowledge is actually pretty captivating and interesting to me. So that being said, to the question now. <laughs> I, just, I just want to note that I did not pay him even a penny <laughs> to say that. 
You don't have to say that at all. Available please, please. available in bookstores for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I brought it too. <laughs> Oh man, awesome! Oh my goodness, <laughs> seriously, I just love giving giving credit where credit's due. It, it's a really good book. I'm probably gonna keep reading it after this. So, okay, <laughs> so my question now: the dilemma <clears throat> uh, that Nathaniel Fanning or Captain Dion uh, was facing as he was captured and nearing a time of undoubtedly thorough questioning by the British mm -hmm. was whether to claim uh, his uh, French citizenship as a naturalized subject in 1781 or to take the stance of an American patriot. Um, and of course, you know, and I know what he did in the end, which ended up being the right choice. Um, but the question I'd like to ask based off of a dilemma like this is what kind of doors, and this is something you can definitely speak to as well, Carl, but what kind of doors, if not what kind of borders did being an American or not being an American open or close? Like what kind of things were exempt from you or what kind of things were open to you as an American citizen, be it whether you want to talk about back in the 17, 18, 1900s, or if you want to speak to modern day, by all means. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's really, um, you know, the, the, in a sense, I'm, well, first of all, just thank you for, for reading. And um, you know, I think you. That's, a, that's a super, <laughs> A super crucial question. I mean, I think the question of what being an American, look, you're a person who's, I was born, born a US citizen, but my, my grandparents were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Um, and um, all, you know, in the 20th century. Um, and, you know, I think the, the question of what do you get by becoming a US citizen is a really interesting and it's a fundamental question because it really is, it gets to the question of why, why we care about either letting people um, become Americans or limiting access to US citizenship. And this is a long and old debate. Um, so, you know, in the period that you're mentioning in, the, in, 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 in my book, um, which is during the American Revolutionary War, actually being an American is, it's a bit of a, um, if you have another choice, I don't know why you would necessarily make the choice to present yourself as American, although right. many people do, um, because it's not, it's not a great status, right? You're the citizen of a, of a, so, you know, with all due respect to the, to the great mighty United States that it is now in 1778 or 79 or 80, uh, the United States is a little marginal country divided internally at war with the global superpower. Um, Great Britain, and it's not looking too good um, for most of the Revolutionary War, right? It doesn't look really, really look up until 1781. Um, so, you know, becoming an American citizen doesn't necessarily get you a lot. It's in the 1790s that it starts becoming more advantageous, and that's really because of the French Revolutionary Wars, when there's this huge break um, in, um, uh, in Europe, uh, where first uh, France goes to war with Britain and then with much of the rest of Europe, then France conquers most of the rest of Europe. Um, and so a lot of countries that had previously been huge carriers of um, shipping, places like the Netherlands have been primarily neutral. The Netherlands, Denmark, um, the German states, they all sort of have to take sides in this war. And the, the, the only neutrals who are left are really the, the Americans. Um, and so that's part of why there's that huge expansion that I was talking about. And that continues throughout really a lot of the 19th century, right? The United States remains neutral in most of the wars of the 19th century. Um, you know, I think we all, those of us who went to elementary school or certainly high school in the United States have all heard of the Monroe Doctrine, right? Where um, uh, uh, James Monroe, uh, in a speech written by his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, declares that, you know, the United States is now sort of in charge of the Western hemisphere, but we're not gonna get involved in what goes on in Europe and they don't get involved in what goes on here. Um, but what that boils down to is basically that the U.S. becomes the traders of the world. They become, by the mid-20th century, also the industrial center of the world. So, you know, being a U.S. citizen now, having that U.S. passport, it gets you a lot. But um, uh, back in the, in the period that I was looking at, it didn't get you so much at all. So I think part of what, you know, in a sense, I think part of what you're, part of what you're, you're talking about here right. is, is the way in which, um, you know, the United States has now become a place where... Um, it's really valuable to be part of this community um, and, uh, you know, lets you travel all over the world and gets you, um, you know, lots of advantages, which, um, and so uh, 
to gain access to it. One of the ways you gain access to that is by serving the country. Um, I mean, another way you gain access to it is just by being lucky and getting born here. But um, for those of us, those of us who aren't born here, for our fellow citizens who aren't born here, you know, one of the ways that you do that is by is by serving in the military as you are, and 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 um, you know, and and thank you for that service. And and it's um, you know really inspiring actually to to see someone coming into the into this community through through an act of service and an act of um, an act of patriotism of of serving like that. So that's that's really. Um, you know, I find it very moving, actually. I, I kind of got a little teary when I saw the picture of your citizenship right. ceremony because it's really, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's one thing to be born a citizen; it's another sure. to, um, to choose. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious, actually. I wanted to ask you, Jason, if I, if I, if I can. Um, I'm just curious what the, how sort of your, um, your community of, um, of crewmates um, reacted to you becoming a citizen and. I mean, you said a little bit about how your your officers, right. um, you know, were thinking about it. But I mean, was this was this something that they were aware of? Was this something that they were excited about? Or um, I, I would say the latter, absolutely. Um, there was a huge amount of support um, from from everybody that knew, um, especially my my direct superiors, all the way up to the captain. They would consistently be checking up on my progress and whatnot, and I can. I can still remember the thunderous roars during the, the ceremony once they finally like, you know, called my name up to come and receive my certificate and whatnot after we all took the oath. And that's another thing that, you know, which I think it made that ceremony all that more special, not just for me though, but for everyone else that was there that was becoming a citizen because they got so lucky that my captain really wanted this to be done on the ship that they as well got to have their ceremony done on the USS Constitution. Typically, if you get to come on the Constitution, you're just visiting, right? You, you got to get sworn in as an American citizen on it. That is history being made upon the shoulders of history or upon the decks of history. It's a history sandwich if you will <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy but the moment they no offense to the two or three army guys that were there but they cheered louder when I, when they called me <laughs> right? because and and that really as you mentioned it it solidified that that sense of of, of admiration and of appreciation for what it means to be able to choose but not only that, technically that means this country also chose me because they could have said no, <laughs> all right? And that mutual understanding and that mutual dedication to each other is what I believe not by birth creates a patriot. You know, I choose you and you choose me. Therefore, anything else that comes to break that bond, we both face together. So that's something that I will take to my grave, honestly. Um, and um, going based off of that question, um, I'd like to go to Carl now, <laughs> talking about uh, be it your professional career-based curiosities or um, personal triggers in your past or in your heritage. Um, have you found your own citizenship to have impacted your identity in a significant way or is it just another page in your story? Oh, wow. Um, that's a, that's a fascinating question, but I want to take a second first though, to jump back to, because what you were just saying about mm -hmm. choice and, um, and the future about what that means that the, you know, the nation, uh, valued you as much as you did being part of that, um, and, and reflecting that on to, uh, Nathan's, you know, description of, American identity abroad and the value of that and the increasing value of that in a, in a mobile world. You know, one of the other aspects, and we see this with a lot of American mariners, both, um, both you know, merchant marine, but uh, also Navy sailors, yeah. is that the other thing citizenship brought um, and, and the Navy as an opportunity to become part of that were opportunities um, for a life ashore in America. And, you know, when we say, when we use those phrases, life in America, we have a tendency to have 
kind of associations of freedom that, that you know, may have been different from somewhere else or political freedom. But quite frankly, the other thing that was there were economic opportunities that, that were further and fewer to be found in Europe, particularly the opportunity to have your own land and your own farm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, rural development and the huge hinterland, the massive continent that America had meant that there were far more opportunities for a lot of particularly Europeans, but, but also um, you know, uh, Caribbean Islanders and others to um, have a, something that was their own, to have a future that was their own. Uh, and, and this, we've talked about this earlier, this is one of the things we see with um, uh, you know, interest in um, free blacks and African-Americans participating in the Navy in the early 19th century as well too is that it was an, uh, an opportunity that meritocracy of sea, if you will, where they tended to be better respected than on shore, gave them opportunities to improve their life uh, uh, at sea at, or on shore later on. For myself as part of that identity, getting back to your question, Jay said, you know, I see that reflected uh, in the travels that, that I've done uh, as a sailor prior to becoming a, a shore side historian. Uh, I spent a long time working on um, commercial tall ships uh, in uh, conducting educational uh, uh, programs um, abroad. And so as a result, I've sailed uh, throughout much of the Caribbean, Atlantic coast and, and throughout you know, South Pacific from Hawaii and Tahiti to California and back. Um, and you know, one of the things you see coming to other countries as an American is this sense of of identity and uh, um, and a and again that uh, economic output, right? You know whether whether it's tourism or education or or commodities, we are still uh, uh, an exporter of that. And um, even in in you know places where we have a less friendly uh, welcome there is a recognition of, of the value of that nation's uh, you know, economic strength and, and contribution on, on the sea. Right. Um, and you know, in ports and other places as well too. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, it is sort of a, a fundamental thing that you, you really can't escape, especially the more traveling uh, that you do. Yeah. And it, it shapes how the world sees you as well as how you see the world, I think. Very true. Yeah. This brings us to around seven o'clock. We were um, looking at trying to keep this down to about an hour, but I want to give each of you uh, a chance to give any other thoughts or considerations. Is there anything we haven't touched on that, that remains pivotal? I know we could probably spend the rest of the night and all of tomorrow continuing to talk about all of the branches of offshoots that we've only begun crawling out on here, but... Uh, mm -hmm. As long as we're done by eight o'clock tomorrow morning, I'll, I'll be okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. On the subject of responsibilities, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Nathan, if, you, if you'd like to take it away, you're more than welcome to. No, no, I, I mean, I just, I would just, um, you know, I just wanted to thank, uh, thank both of you because um, it's really um, wonderful to get to, to, you know, I think that's, that's just a wonderful opportunity to kind of talk about the past and the present together that we don't that we don't necessarily always get. Um, I think on either end, um, an opportunity to think about the ways in which um, this big subject that matters to all of us, um, citizenship and and belonging, um, or two subjects, I guess, citizenship and belonging, since there's they're not necessarily totally coterminous with each other. Um, you know, has intersected over a long period of time with, with this, um, you know, this institution uh, of the Navy. Yeah, and, uh, real quick interruption, I'm sorry, but I, I just, something just pinged when you said citizenship and belonging, just for the, the edification of somebody, or just me, honestly. <laughs> Could you speak more personally of what the differences mean to you versus citizenship and belonging? Because somebody might just generalize it and say, Oh, you're a citizen of America, so you belong there. You're not one of us, you know. Whatever it is, the ostr the ostracization, sure. ostracization. 
you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Basically the seclusion yeah. between groups and uh, or the melting together of groups. Like what, yeah. what's that key difference in your opinion? I mean, for me, you know, citizenship is a legal category and belonging is a feeling. Um, you know, you, can, you can't um, show up at the Canadian border and say, I feel like I belong to Canada and they let you in. Um, you need to produce paperwork. Sure. Um, you know, just like as Adam Smith said, you don't show up at the butcher and say, look, I'm in such great health, give me some meat. Um, you have to pay him. Um, so, you know, I think um, to me, the, to me those, are, those are, you know, um, often they go together, right? The feeling of right. patriotism, the feeling of belonging goes together with citizenship. But, but I think there are lots of cases. I mean, I, I'm an adventurer guess here that you felt that you belonged in the United States before you were a citizen. Um, um, you know, and I, I similarly, I, you know, I, I feel I belong, but there are moments when I'm certainly a citizen there, but there are moments when I think, hmm, I don't feel quite a sense of belonging about this particular thing. Um, right. And I think it's worth going back, you know, if you go back to the 19th century or even the 20th century or maybe even the present, right, there are, um, you know, the, there are populations in this country um, who have not felt that they belonged even when they were citizens. So my ancestors, um, as I am, were Jewish. Um, and when they came, um, and look, anti-Semitism still exists, but when, when my grandparents came, anti-Semitism was much more common, much more overt, just as um, racism against people of um, Asian or African descent was, um, you know, a hundred years ago and still is. Um, and those people, many of them would be citizens, but would not feel that they belonged in various kinds of ways. So, um, you know, I think, um, I think we hope that there's a kind of confluence between those two, um, between both between belonging and citizenship, but, but in a way, I think it's a struggle to bring those two into alignment uh, mm -hmm. always. Um, I don't know if you, I don't know how, I don't know if you, that you would agree with that or if you. Absolutely. Yes. Like, and as Carl mentioned earlier, this is, this is the kind of stuff, like there's no vanilla straight answer to it. It's something that it changes from person to person. And sometimes even for the same person from day to day, you know, different situations, uh, world, like the world climate or the, how the market is going or um, the political situation, whatever it is, can create either um, a reason to reconnect or a reason to run away from whatever it is that you may or may not have claimed a sense of belonging to. Um, but I absolutely agree with you um, as far as your your explanation on that, which is why I kind of wanted to ping on that because it's, it's something that I believe is crucial in understanding. And I'll just conclude it all with this, make these uh, my, my final remarks here. Um, but I'd like to borrow the words of uh, Dr. Mount Monroe saying, um, where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. And I think something like that should be basically a call to action for be it those of us here in this panel or all of you watching at home or abroad, wherever you're from, um, you it, it is it is crucial it is important um it is i would say indispensable you can't live without it or you can't live properly without it to know the purpose of not only who you are but where you're from what does it all mean and that is yet another reason why i'm just so honored and excited to be here and to be a part of this um, and I'd like to thank the museum staff and, and everyone that was involved in allowing such a humble sailor as myself um, the, the mic time to be able to share a, a pieces of myself, essentially, to bring to awareness the importance of talking about this kind of stuff and educating yourself on why it's important. Because you look at the standard American out there that's just, whoo, America, and going around professing their allegiance and whatnot. Some of them do know, but there are some that don't really know what it took to get to the place where America is right now. And what's more, where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable, because you don't know that, now you see no clear or you have no sense of urgency in terms of creating or continuing a legacy that now the future generations will be just as equally, if not more proud of, to be a part of. 
And that's where you get, yes, they're American citizens, but do they belong? And so that's, that's something I believe is a clear call to action. And because we don't want to abuse the citizenship that we have, which is an immense privilege. Um, and as I was speaking to my father, to my dad earlier about this very stream, you know, <laughs> He, he basically made a beautiful point saying that um, being an American citizen brings a slew of privileges, but with those privileges comes also responsibility. You know, Uncle Ben said it best, right? You know, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. And that's something I believe we all could benefit from thinking about just a little longer. So floor is yours, Carl. I, I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> That's so horrible. You're I here. appreciate it. Yeah. You're here. We do have one question uh, that, that came in that was someone was asking. Yeah, I, we've had a couple of questions from the uh, audience, but I think we've touched on um, most of them already. Um, but someone asked what books uh, you would recommend to read on this subject. Um, and uh, oh, what you certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, Nathan's getting his plugs here, um, not only for his uh, current book, uh, for his book, Citizen Sailors, but uh, his most recent book touches some of these broader, I think, uh, social issues. Is that fair to say, Nathan, the co-edited book, World at Sea? Um, I'll ask you, Nathan, are there, excuse me, is, are there other works that, that you would recommend continuing to explore in this for someone you know, from the general public who may not already have an academic depth to it. Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, if you're, you know, if you're interested in the kind of um, the citizenship question, uh, there are a couple of really good books on that. Um, so Mark Jones' book, um, um, uh, Birthright Citizens, which is primarily about free black people in the antebellum South. Um, but then another excellent book um, is Lucy Sawyer's, um, I'm trying to find it on my shelf so I can remind myself of the title. Um, uh, under, it has the word flag in the title, Under the Starry Flag, Under the Starry Flag, which is um, uh, really the story of a, a group of Irishmen who uh, try to go back in, uh, Irish Americans who go back in the, seven, uh, the 1860s and try to save Ireland and end up in a in prison basically um, in, in British prisons um, so that's really good on that and then on the maritime stuff you know honestly uh, though it has to be used with care you know Samuel Elliott Morrison's Maritime History of Massachusetts Bay <laughs> an ancient book that's, you know more than 100 years old but um, uh, you know he was uh, apparently an insufferable human being but um, a really good historian um, and he would be just, I, can I just say he would be horrified at this panel because um, in, in his opinion, if you weren't a Mayflower descendant, you shouldn't be writing maritime history or have anything to do with it. So um, we would all be um, out, of, out of the running, but, um, but it is a very good book. Uh, maritime that was history Maritime Bay. History of Massachusetts Bay. Massachusetts Bay, Bay yeah. I'm, I'm certain it's on a shelf right behind you, Jason. Uh, who is sitting in the Samuel Elliott Morrison okay. library at the uh, USS really Constitution. <laughs> All right. See, I didn't yeah, have to yeah. me to plug but, you're, but, you know, you raise a good point <laughs> that it is a romanticized sort of image of, of the maritime history that, that I think has largely, uh, you know, given way to the, some of these more nuanced things that we've been touched on and, and talking about tonight. Um, you know, I think in terms of the value, uh, and this raises a, a whole nother uh, uh, kind of issue that we've only tangentially talked about. Um, you know, Jeff Bolster's Black Jacks talks about the value that uh, the experiences of black sailors um, in, the, uh, in the 18th and early 19th centuries and uh, sort of the nature of service at sea versus the um, sense of belonging, as we were just talking about, or lack thereof, that they received on land. Uh, so that that as well certainly, I think, touches on that. Some of those similar issues. Yeah, um, I think that's a pretty good starting point uh, for folks who would be um, be so inclined to kind of pursue that with more. Um, I want to uh, thank both of you for joining us tonight. I really appreciate um, your contributions. Uh, thank you to everyone. Um, 
who uh, uh, joined us uh, attending either in, uh, in our registered Zoom attendees or on Facebook Live. Um, if you've missed part of this or showed up late, this video will be archived um, and uh, available through the USS Constitution Museum website and the USS Constitution Museum's uh, YouTube channel. You can learn more about the makeup of the crew, some of the tasks that we were talking about, uh, and where the crew came from through the museum's website and our crew database, which uh, excerpts uh, associated with 1812 are available for exploration on the website. You can see some of the patterns that we've begun talking about. Other patterns of national identity associated with sailors that you can see on our website include um, the Ira Dye database of prisoners of war, American uh, sailors who were kept in British prisons during 1812. And that database is also searchable and available on the USS Constitution uh, Museum's website. So uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, thanks also to uh, Sarah Dunbar, our Assistant Director of Education, and Kate Monet, our Library and Archivist, and Robert Kinney, our Director of Exhibits, who are silently in the background tonight, assisting with the technical sides of this. Uh, stay tuned, we will be producing more uh, panel discussions on topics in, in the future. Uh, and again, thank you to the Institute for Museum and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Humanities for uh, helping to fund these presentations. Jason, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk about this. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.